discussion. What I want to do is really do uh, talk about four things. One is a bit of the history, because there is a bit of kind of Groundhog Day uh, element about uh, Britain's position in this whole uh, issue. Then a little bit about what might, might be called the State of the Union. Uh, a little bit about reasons for staying in, and a bit about the differences between 1975, the referendum then, and a possible referendum in 2017. First of all, I think the most important uh, thing to remember about the history of Britain's accession to the <coughs> European uh, Economic Community is that it was basically a kind of negative uh, decision rather than a positive uh, uh, decision. We all know the kind of post-war history uh, and the various reasons, both political and economic, that kept Britain out of the original uh, Treaty of Rome. And then we know of the subsequent debate here in Britain, starting with the Macmillan government and culminating in de Gaulle's veto in January 1963, and then resuming under a rather reluctant uh, Labour government that was elected in 1964, on the back, if you remember, of Gateskill talking about uh, the common market as the end of a thousand years of history, and Harold Wilson as the Prime Minister reluctantly concluding uh, that there was no alternative but to apply for membership of the European Economic Community. His original idea was to make some kind of relationship between EFTA, the European Free Trade Association, and the European Economic Community. That uh, got nowhere, partly because the dynamics of the two organizations were very different, partly because uh, President de Gaulle in particular uh, remembered the so-called maudling plan, which would effectively have subsumed the fledgling EEC into uh, EFTA. They looked at a North American Free Trade Association, and there, was, there were pockets of support within the US Congress, but the basic American attitude uh, was one of complete lack of interest, the feeling that Britain was a European country, should be a European country. America had done its bit in the war through the Marshall Plan, and Britain should get on with it. The third alternative was go it alone, and that uh, in a world dominated by two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, with China as a rising power, was not uh, uh, feasible. And so, basically, there was no alternative. So it was a, it was a rather reluctant uh, view. And throughout the period which led uh, uh, Wilson to renew uh, the British application to join in 67, there was opposition quite strong opposition within both uh, main political parties. Uh, that said, uh, at the time of the 1970 general election, uh, the Labour government was on the verge of beginning negotiations with its uh, future European partners. And of course, Wilson unexpectedly, and against the evidence of the opinion polls, lost the election uh, to uh, Ted Heath. Now, yes, the kind of mythology is of uh, Heath, clearly a pro-European, but of a party that was united behind him. Of course, that was far from the case. A number of Conservative candidates stood in the 1970 election on platforms within their own constituencies which were hostile to membership of the EEC. Within a very few months of the Conservatives coming to power, Heath was being advised that Enoch Powell, who was still then uh, a member of the Conservative Party, although uh, not in the Cabinet uh, because of his uh, infamous Rivers of Blood uh, uh, speech uh, some time before, Heath was being advised that Enoch Powell saw opposition to entry to the European Economic Community as an opportunity to unseat Heath and take over the leadership of the Conservative uh, Party. Within the Labour Party, what was already uh, opposition hardened in opposition. They were shocked at the fact that they'd lost the election, determined to get rid of Heath uh, as soon as possible, disillusioned for a time with Harold Wilson. And famously, in 1971, Jim Callaghan, who was Home Secretary and Chancellor of the Exchequer, had supported the 1967 application for membership, an application which in turn had been vetoed once again by de Gaulle. Uh, Callaghan made a speech known as the language of Chaucer speech. And he telephoned the editor of the Times before making it, uh, to say, you must send a man to cover my speech because this is going to be the speech of the next leader of the Labour Party. And in that speech, Callaghan basically said, addressing himself to President Pompidou, Pompidou had given an interview to the BBC Panorama programme in which he not unreasonably said that when Britain joined the European Economic Community, he hoped nonetheless that the, French, the, the position of the French language within the communities would be respected. So, said Callaghan, so, Monsieur Pompidou, 
Are you saying that only with your permission can we in future use the language of Milton and, and Shakespeare and Chaucer? Well, Monsieur Pompidou, said Callum, I have a message for you, uh, and for the sake of clarity, I'll say it in French. Non merci beaucoup. Uh, now, that's, Wilson was in Helsinki. The speech was reported to Wilson, including also uh, Callaghan's supposedly private conversation with the editor of the Times, within 40 minutes. And the Labour Party, that was, in a way, the signal for the, for the split which dominated Labour Party uh, politics uh, from then on, and which led to a, the, the compromise uh, which Wilson had to agree to in order to prevent the Labour Party voting that if they came back into power they would take Britain out of the European Economic Community, namely the idea of a referendum first mooted, you won't be surprised to know, by Tony Benn, uh, rejected at first by the Labour uh, shadow cabinet, but Callaghan, uh, with great foresight, said this could turn out to be the life draft to which the Labour Party, uh, the Labour Party clings. Meanwhile, the negotiations for entry under Ted Heath were coming to a conclusion. Uh, undoubtedly, the terms which Heath negotiated, pretty clearly the same kind of terms as a Labour government would have, uh, would have uh, negotiated. And it, two things, I think, of, of, of interest, really. One is that Heath, having inadvertently said that membership would only happen with the full-hearted consent of the British people and Parliament, rather than the British people in Parliament, uh, gave Wilson a respectable opening for suggesting that uh, Heath had half-promised uh, a referendum. Uh, secondly, and often now overlooked, in October uh, 1972, on the eve of British accession, the nine, uh, the six existing member states and the three future member states, Britain, Denmark and Ireland, met in Paris. And all the nine governments committed themselves to two things. One was economic and monetary union by 1980, and the second was political union. Uh, by uh, 1980. Uh, those were very public uh, commitments, and during the renegotiation of British membership, which occurred under the Labour government elected in 1974, uh, Harold Wilson explicitly and publicly in European Council conclusions reaffirmed those two uh, commitments. So, uh, although it would be too much to suggest that um, the British public generally were paying attention uh, to those things, those were very public British commitments. So those who say what we joined was simply a free trade area uh, overlook both the nature of the Treaty of Rome, uh, which was very well discussed in Parliament, but also those two specific uh, commitments. Harold Wilson promised, if re-elected, that there would be a renegotiation and uh, a referendum. Were the British people sold in that referendum campaign uh, a false uh, bill of goods? Well, I hope I've answered the issue of Europe only as a free trade area. More difficult is an issue which is bubbling away at the moment, uh, namely uh, the fact that during the campaign, British ministers did claim uh, that Britain had a veto over any piece of legislation uh, that it found impossible to swallow. The basis of that assertion was the Luxembourg Compromise, which, as we know and was known at the time, was merely a political agreement. But although ministers uh, could be said to have misled the British public, they did so, I think, uh, honestly, in the sense that one of the conditions which Pompidou had insisted on as a price of British membership was that the British government committed itself to the French interpretation of the Luxembourg Compromise. And there's no doubt in my mind that British ministers did regard the Luxembourg Compromise as tantamount to a veto. Uh, when Peter Walker, as agriculture minister in 1982, invoked the Luxembourg Compromise and was voted down, including by the French, uh, it was demonstrated how uh, hollow the Luxembourg uh, Compromise uh, was. And we may see in the next few days uh, whether that is demonstrated again uh, uh, or not. The other factor in the tenor of the times, and again this is uh, something which is rumbles through British politics ever since, is the belief, which was not just uh, in the minds of British Prime Ministers, Heath and, uh, and Wilson had this in common, but it was also basically the view of, of Pompidou at the time and of, and of Brandt, that the, this project would effectively be run by the three big uh, countries. 
all of them, I think, underestimated the significance of the institutions and the institutional impetus inherent in the nature of the treaties, radically different, as we know, from any other kind of international uh, 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 treaty. And I think that echoes uh, to this day, uh, including with the Conservatives' preoccupation with the words uh, ever closer union uh, and their desire to get those uh, words out of, the, um, uh, out of the treaty, at least as far as Britain is, uh, is concerned. The terms of membership which Heath was obliged to accept were very unfavourable. Uh, the French manoeuvred the British government, and it was probably difficult not to be so manoeuvred, into a position whereby either there was a half-decent deal to be had on the budget, or there was a half-decent deal to be had on the issue of access to the common market for New Zealand butter and lamb. Now, you would say, well, that's a no-brainer, but at the time, the dominance of the New Zealand argument in British politics, particularly in Conservative Party politics, uh, meant that he favoured uh, the deal for New Zealand, and Britain accepted a financial settlement which involved her even as one of the uh, poorer member states of the European uh, community on a per capita basis as being at one stage the largest and then after Germany the second largest net contributor to the European uh, community. And that was at the heart of uh, Harold Wilson's renegotiation and of course at the heart of Margaret Thatcher's uh, battle for the uh, British rebate. So there was never a moment at which uh, British membership was not an issue of, of controversy, and the inability to point to those tangible benefits was very evident. Jim Callaghan, as Prime Minister, talking to Prime Minister Karaman Lees of Greece in the, uh, in the prelude to Greek accession, said to him, look, I, I support British membership of the European community, but you will not find a single British person who can point to what they see as a single tangible benefit uh, of, our, of our membership. And that rumbled through, and although the rebate uh, to an extent settled uh, that particular issue, uh, it left certainly in the mind of Margaret Thatcher uh, a view that you could only win in Europe by, by battling and that uh, her partners were not to be uh, trusted. If you look back today at the Brew speech 25 years, uh, 25 years on, uh, it is, as Tony Blair said when I uh, produced a copy to show him, uh, in advance of him making a speech here at Birmingham uh, University, one of only two speeches, I think I'm right in saying, uh, about the European Union that he made in this country as opposed to abroad, uh, Blair said, well, this is a pretty good speech, isn't it? And indeed, if you read it today, uh, in the light of what has happened to the European Union uh, uh, since, uh, some of what Margaret Thatcher says about the, the nature of the, uh, of the state and about liberal economics looks uh, like um, uh, part of the acquis. What she said then about uh, enlargement, uh, including that, let us never forget, that Prague, Warsaw and Budapest are also great European uh, cities, was regarded at the time as an outrage. Uh, the idea that uh, the European community should be enlarged to Eastern Europe uh, was one which she was not quite alone in espousing, but she was certainly in a minority uh, in uh, uh, espousing. It's also worth remembering that her famous no, no, no of 1990 was not a no, no, no to the single currency, but a no, no, no to Delors, uh, Jacques Delors' speech in which he posited the idea of the Commission as a European administration answerable to the European Parliament with the European Council uh, as a kind of, uh, a kind of Senate. Uh, whether other heads of government would have shared Margaret Thatcher's view at the time, I don't know. They certainly weren't prepared to uh, say so any more than they're prepared to say today that they don't want Jean-Claude Juncker as president of the, of the commission. But certainly you would not find, I think, a single head of government today who would do more than even pay lip service uh, to the thesis that Delors was advancing uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the time. With John Major and Maastricht and the Maastricht opt-out, uh, and subsequent opt-outs, including uh, on justice uh, and home affairs, came, I think, a, a turning point in Britain's relations with the European Union. This notion, of course, of a Europe of different speeds dates from the Tindermans uh, uh, report, but the Maastricht Treaty enshrines it uh, in, a, in a very, or potentially uh, permanent and certainly a very uh, significant way. In terms of domestic politics, uh, Margaret Thatcher, out of office, sitting in the House of Lords, made herself the focus of public opposition within the Conservative Party to the terms of the Maastricht uh, Treaty. And she grouped around her a group of young uh, loyalists for whom 
loyalty to the fallen leader was synonymous with opposition to the Maastricht Treaty and therefore to the idea of European Union. And among those who sat at her feet uh, was a young politician called uh, David Cameron. Now, although with the Blair-Brown uh, government, uh, some of those arguments uh, disappeared, quite a lot of the rivalry between those two men focused around Europe in terms of the, uh, in terms of the uh, single currency. And uh, Blair's decision against his better judgment to offer a referendum uh, on the constitutional treaty uh, was as much to do with his fear that the Murdoch press would, if he didn't offer a referendum, turn around and publicly advocate Gordon Brown's leadership of the Labour Party uh, as it was to do with considerations of Europe itself. So what I'm trying to suggest to all of that is the extent to which these issues have resonated and therefore continue to resonate. If we look at the State of the Union uh, uh, today from a, from a narrow British uh, perspective, if I were Cameron, I would argue, well, for a start, when Britain, uh, when the European community was first founded, agriculture took 90% of the community budget. When Britain joined, it was 76%. Now it's around 40% uh, or less. Uh, uh, enlargement, if you take away all the stuff about widening versus deepening, uh, enlargement as the fulfillment of part of the very founding purpose of the European community, namely peace and democracy and stability in Europe, a huge achievement. The single market, incomplete though it is, uh, a huge achievement which would not have happened without uh, the pressure and leadership which Margaret Thatcher uh, brought to bear. Uh, a foreign policy and a security policy, which however inadequate uh, they are, are nonetheless uh, real and have uh, the capacity to become uh, more so. The notion of uh, the European Union as a uh, federal superstate is not one that anybody now in the European Union uh, espouses, although we are, it seems to me, in this paradoxical situation, which is uh, certainly one for, for debate, whereby at a, more than at any other time in the history of the European Union, you have leaders who are not committed uh, to the traditional view of a federal Europe, but who nonetheless, as members of the Eurozone, may be, question mark, may be embarked on something which will actually take the European Union, Britain and one or two others apart, closer to uh, a genuine federal union uh, than ever before. Britain has secured its opt-outs for good or ill. We have a flexible union, uh, again, for good or ill, in more ways than one. And if you look at the competences enshrined in the, in the treaties, uh, here we are um, all those years later, and the European Union does not run our health policy, our education policy, our police, our army, our judicial system, or our uh, fiscal policy. If you look at those things that are lacking uh, in the um, modern-day European Union, the lack of coherent policies for energy, something that has dogged the European Union since its uh, inception, the lack of completion of the single market, especially in services, uh, where Germany remains in particular one of the more protectionist member states, uh, the failure of adequate competitiveness, uh, the failure still to have a serious, coherent uh, uh, foreign policy, all those are on the downside. And, of course, uh, beneath all that is uh, something which I think the citizens of Europe per perceive, which is a uh, kind of failure of leadership. And I think it is illustrative of the present juncture that, well, I mean, uh, anecdote, I mean, about, about two months ago, uh, a former European commissioner, not British, sent me an email uh, saying, of course, the whole of the European Union all of the leaders of the European Union are relying on David Cameron to try and block Jean-Claude Juncker while slagging him off uh, at the same time for doing so. So we have a situation in which, uh, it seems to me, the European Union leaders have A, failed to carry out uh, the terms of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, Pacta Sunt Servanda, and on the other hand, uh, despite the fact that they don't consider Jean-Claude Juncker the best man to, to lead them, the chances are that he will, uh, in a few days' time, uh, be nominated or, uh, as the next president of the European Commission. Reason, reasons for, reasons for, 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 for staying in. Uh, and I raise this because I think that one of the most difficult issues for those of us who are, who are pro-European is how do we find in the modern day the best arguments. My own view is that there are kind of three in, asc in ascending order. The first one, not insignificant, is that we are 28 basically querulous, self-interested nation-states. Uh, 
And having sat around the negotiating table in Brussels for five years, I was always struck not how, by how strong this union is, but actually how fragile uh, it is. So nobody, it seems to me, has yet devised a better method of managing the potentially querulous relations between 28 uh, countries. And a very good example, it seems to me, of the way it works is if you go back to the BSE uh, crisis, uh, where the British government, through failure of its own uh, health and safety uh, laws inflicted on itself and through the export of, uh, of, of cattle and beef on its partners a potentially hugely dangerous uh, disease both in terms of animal health uh, and uh, human health. And only through the European Union's uh, boycotting effectively of British beef products was the British government forced to bring its own laws and policies uh, in line. Having done so, when British beef was again exportable and the French government refused to allow uh, British beef uh, imports, partly on the back of, of their own uh, um, uh, infected blood scandal and fear of public opinion, they were taken by the Commission to the European Court when the European Court found against France the French government still refused to open their borders until such time as they were threatened with massive fines. So the British government gained, in a sense, by being forced by Europe to amend its own laws and then uh, by having the power of the European Union once again to open the frontiers to its uh, 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 products. Second argument, argument which I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, today, are all the, the, the economic benefits, including the single market benefits that uh, uh, result from membership of the European Union, and more particularly the cost of uh, being outside and nonetheless being governed by decisions taken by others in which Britain would have uh, 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 no say. Also the fact that, and again I think in some of the Eurosceptic argument this is overlooked, um, the fact that there might be no EU regulation, although, as I've just said, chances are that uh, a great deal of EU regulation would continue to uh, need to continue to apply if we were to have access to the market of our former uh, partners. But the absence of EU regulation does not mean no regulation. We're not going to have no agricultural policy. We're not going to have no rules on working time, etc., etc., etc. But finally, it seems to me, the most important argument uh, is what I would call uh, safety in democratic uh, numbers. The fact that in a dangerous world, uh, to have as your uh, neighbours people who share your democratic values, who share the same rule of law through the European Union, is probably uh, the best safeguard of our freedoms that we could have. Finally, what about the differences between 1975 and 2017? Well, of course, then we had never before had a national uh, referendum. It was something new, and uh, we focused on the issue. Since then, referendums have become old hat, and as we know from experience of others, including France, people don't necessarily focus on the issue. I have a friend with a house in Normandy who, on the day of the French vote on the constitutional treaty, went on the Sunday morning into his local boulangerie and he said to the boulanger, have you voted? And she said, yes, of course. How did you vote? Uh, no, she said. And my friend said, well, why did you vote? No. And she said, well, because I hate Chirac and he's keeping up putting up the taxes. Uh, and my friend said, but surely this is a vote about the constitutional treaty? Oh, she said, what is that? <laughs> so that is that the, the, the kick the government syndrome, uh, I think, is a very real one. Secondly, of course, uh, in 1975, we were still uh, in the Cold War with a very real fear of uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a generation for whom memories of World War II uh, were uh, uh, very vivid. Uh, Europe's economic success story was very palpable compared with uh, the very lack of economic success uh, in, our own, uh, in our own country. So the attraction of the European Union economically was more visible and tangible than perhaps it is uh, 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 today. That there was no alternative was also, I mean, I still myself believe that to be the case, but it was perhaps more apparent then uh, than it is uh, in today's more obviously uh, global, global uh, world. By and large, then, with the exception of the Daily Express and the Communist Morning Star, the British press was unitedly pro-European. Uh, uh, there was an ability to mount, I mean, the European, the Europe, I, was remember, I remember being told that the European Commission spent 80% of its total annual information uh, budget in the United Kingdom during the referendum uh, campaign uh, in a way that would simply not be uh, legally or politically possible uh, 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 today. Um, 
in terms of the position of the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party of today doesn't, does not strike me as being very different from uh, the Labour Party uh, then. And this, I think, is uh, an interesting issue. You know, what, what might David Cameron get? Uh, my own view is not a, not a very uh, a great deal. And some say, well, in that case, he's, he has no hope of carrying his party uh, with him. Well, Harold Wilson didn't get a very great deal uh, either. Uh, and certainly he would have got nowhere had he and Jim Callaghan as Foreign Secretary not promised very early on in the negotiations not to reopen either the Treaty of Rome or the Treaty of uh, Accession. Wilson got enough to get it past his cabinet. He did not get enough to get it past the Labour Party. Uh, the Labour Party voted against the terms which its own government had uh, negotiated. After that vote, narrowly won by Wilson, he and Callaghan went off to Jamaica for a Commonwealth Prime Minister's meeting, and Ian Mercado, a prominent Eurosceptic, tried to reopen the decision in the NEC, i.e. to persuade the Labour Party that it would campaign against its own uh, government. Uh, uh, Wilson, uh, from Jamaica, telephoned the Israeli ambassador in London, Wilson had recently sprung from Moscow, a Jewish ballet dancer, and got, got him from uh, Moscow to uh, uh, Israel. And he got uh, the Israeli ambassador to intervene with Ian Mercado, who had a number of Jewish constituents, and persuade Mercado to, 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 to back off. But it was that narrowly uh, fought. But despite the opposition of the Labour Party to its own government, Wilson, as we know, won the referendum uh, with 66% of the vote. Part of that was about personalities. And... The, the trust which people had on the, the, the pro most prominent no campaigners were people such as you know, Powell, Tony Benn, uh, Ian Paisley, the pro-campaigners, uh, Shirley Williams, Ted Heath, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Roy Jenkins, uh, etc. Confidence in those uh, people, as Roy Jenkins subsequently put it, basically the British people uh, trusted uh, those people whose advice they usually took uh, and they took it uh, again. And I think that factor in one form or another uh, will play. Uh, Obviously, the UKIP effect uh, in all of this is a wild card which is uh, difficult to, uh, to measure. But it seems to me that the most difficult thing uh, we face is... I mean, I was 28 in 1975, so I was still relatively young, and there was what I would, I, what I would describe as a kind of Obama, kind of Obama 2008 feeling. There was a kind of, this is bright, confident morning, here is something new and exciting and vibrant, etc. Here was a fairly young organisation which gave us kind of hope for the, hope for the future. Now the European Union isn't young. It looks, a bit, it looks, it looks kind of tired. It looks a bit, uh, a bit, a bit leaderless. How, if at all, can we regenerate uh, that sense of an ideal uh, which is worth supporting? Thank you.